Welcome to the 2024 Boys Lacrosse Online Rules Module. My name is Jason Nickleby. I am an assistant director with the league and the director of the officiating program. I will be narrating the first and last administrative portions of this module. To begin this module, we will cover some general boys lacrosse information and then review the rules changes for 2024. We will then cover the points of emphasis for this year and finish the module with a few rules reminders and administrative items. This is a reminder that if you would like to be considered for a state tournament assignment, you must enter your schedule on the officials and judges schedule form, which is located on the Arbiter Center Hub page. Officials who complete all state tournament tier requirements will receive an email with a link from the league for you to fill out to indicate your availability and interest in being considered for a state tournament assignment. Again, please look for this email in the middle of April. Please complete this. We cannot consider you for an assignment unless you complete this application. In addition, there will be other requirements for state tournament eligible officials. As those requirements are made available, we will communicate that with you at that time. All applicants for the state tournament are reviewed and many observations are based on those who have indicated they would like to be considered for a state tournament assignment. If you have not been observed within the last three years and would like to be, please contact the league office. Officials, we need your schedule online to schedule these observations and to consider you for a tournament assignment. Some observations will be completed remotely via streaming sites. Prior to the start of a contest, the host school is responsible for determining whether or not conditions present a threat to the safety of participants and spectators and will determine whether or not the contest will begin. Once the contest begins, officials have the authority to postpone or suspend a contest due to unsafe weather conditions. That decision may not be overruled. School officials also still have this authority. On-site medical professionals should also be consulted and included in the decision-making process. The superintendent or his or her designee may overrule an official and suspend or postpone a contest once it has begun. In other words, once a contest has begun, either the officials or school authorities may overrule an official and suspend or postpone a contest once it has begun. While lightning on the horizon should warn of potential danger, lightning associated with thunder or thunder alone means that there is immediate danger to athletes, officials, and spectators. The adage, if you can hear it, clear it, should be used to make decisions to postpone or cancel the activity. When considering resumption of an athletic activity, the league recommends that everyone should wait at least 30 minutes after the last flash of lightning or sound of thunder before returning to the field or activity. Remember that each time that we have lightning or thunder, that 30 minute time period starts over. After the game has been temporarily postponed, officials and coaches should communicate about next steps. Officials, please understand that you are working in outdoor sport and you may have games that will have delays. We should not look to cancel the game at the first opportunity. Coaches, officials should not be expected to stay around the site for several hours just in case you might be able to get the game in. Please work together to resume the game if possible. As a reminder, if a coach, parent, or other concerned party has an eligibility question such as chemical or behavior issues, should direct those questions to the activities director. Even if a lacrosse player is ineligible, the officials are not to rule on such matters and all inquiries should be directed to the activities director of the school involved. Even when an AD asks an official to remove a player, the AD needs to take care of this and the officials do not have anything to do with making decisions or applying penalties to alleged bylaw infractions. Coaches should speak with their activities director or consult the bylaws for boys lacrosse in the official league handbook or go to the boys lacrosse activity page on the high school league website. Please pay special attention to the policy for playing out of state teams in scrimmages or games. Also, all coaches, including volunteers, must have a coach's dashboard with requirements completed before doing any coaching. Well, thanks, Jason. Um, my name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter, and I'm glad to be back. It's hard to believe that this will be my 16th season working for the MSHSL in this role. Uh, 
But a few more years of net refing, I suspect. Oh, yeah, I've been doing this for 30-plus years now, I think, on the field, but not quite as long as you, Brad. Well, I, I get asked to come on to this uh, presentation to make Matt look young. So my name is Brad Skiback, and uh, I am uh, very blessed right now to be the National Federation of High Schools Rules Committee member for Section 5, which means I get the chance to actually interact directly with the rulebook. And uh, I am proud to say that I began my officiating career as a, a box across referee in Canada. And this year will be my 47th year of refing. So most of these coaches that we're seeing, I probably did them when they first started playing lacrosse. It's been a long time. A long time. Well, glad to have you back, Brad, and looking forward to a great season. So let's get on with the rules changes. Sounds great. Hello again, and welcome to the 2024 season. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I'm the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials, as well as the rules interpreter. And I'm glad to be back again uh, this year for what is my 17th season in this role. So let's go ahead and get started with the rules changes. Thanks, Jason. Hello, coaches. Hello, officials. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter. I'm glad to be back again for this, my 17th season in this role. Let's get started with the rules changes and updates for 2024. Thanks, Jason, and hello, everyone. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. It's hard to believe that I've been doing this for 18 years. I guess my 17th time through this uh, with our loss of the code. Hi, let me just say that crap. Thank you, Jason. Uh, my name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. Glad to be back this year for the 18th year of uh, MSHSL Boys Lacrosse. Let's get started and look at those rules changes and updates for this year. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse, and glad to be back this year. Uh, let's jump right into the 2024 Boys Lacrosse rules changes and updates. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials, as well as the Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. Glad to be back for this 18th year of MSHSL Boys Lacrosse. And let's get started with the 2024 rules changes. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials for Boys Lacrosse, as well as a Rules Interpreter. And I'm glad to be back for this season. Why don't we get started with the 2024 NFHS Boys Lacrosse Rules Changes. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials, as well as Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. It's great to be back for another year of Boys Lacrosse here in the state of Minnesota, and let's jump right into those 2024 Rules Changes. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials, as well as Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. Great to be back for another year. And let's get right into those 2024 rules changes for Boys Lacrosse. Well, the first change is an easy one. It really is no change in the rules at all. It just takes a description of the goalkeeper's cross and separates it from the description of the crosses for all the other players on the field. There is no impact on play of the game from this change. This next change might seem minor, but it will have some significant impact on teams as well as probably play of the game. The language here updates rule 1-9-1 to include language that says shall be worn as the manufacturer intended for the safety equipment as well as designed for lacrosse for gloves and arm pads. You may recall many past rule books include one or more points of emphasis on wearing equipment properly. The rules committee continues to see unsafe conditions too often so those points of emphasis have now escalated into requirements in the rules. Definitely not something officials want to see but now that it is in the rules, it is something we are obligated to enforce. So let's start with the arm pads. There aren't any manufacturers we're aware of that recommend arm pads be worn just on the bicep or tricep area. They are intended generally for the elbows at that point. 
If the officials see a pad that looks like it's designed to protect the elbow and it's not worn there, it's pushed up onto the bicep, they should remind the player and possibly let the coach know that that pad is being worn incorrectly. If the pad continues to be worn in an unsafe manner, a technical foul is possible. We have to put safety first. It's that simple. As officials, we don't want to be forced to deal with these issues and we ask coaches to address us and preferably do that in practice as well as at games. However, as I said, this is a safety issue and it can't be overlooked. The next piece of language here is about how the chin strap is to be worn. Again, multiple years of points of emphasis have not resulted in the compliance that the rules committee wanted to see. So we now have language that says the chin strap shall be worn under the chin and shall be firmly attached to the helmet firmly enough that the helmet cannot be removed without unsnapping or loosening the chin strap. If the officials see a player who puts on or takes off a helmet without loosening or tightening that chin strap, they are directed to send that player off the field and ask the coach to ensure that the chin strap meets the requirements in the rule before that player returns to the field. If this happens more than a few times for a team, not just for a single player, officials may be forced to start penalizing that team, something we really don't want to do. Coaches, please do not put officials in that position. I know the coach's certification before every game seems like a formality, but it really is not. That certification is where the coach acknowledges that they know all of their players have the required equipment and those players know how to and know that they will properly wear that equipment. Finally, the last one isn't as big of a deal, but uh, the language is already there for 2027 regarding numbers on uniforms. The numbers themselves must contrast with the uniform color starting in 2027. There have been uniforms where the numbers were nearly the same color as a jersey and only offset by a border. Difficult for officials to read, so starting in 2027, the color of the number must officially contrast with the color of the jersey itself. A number of changes have been made to Rule 191, which covers equipment. The changes may seem minor, but will likely have some impact on the game. First, they added the phrase, shall be worn as the manufacturer intended, and then later for gloves and arm pads added the phrase, designed for lacrosse. You may recall many past rule books have included one or more points of emphasis on wearing equipment properly. Unfortunately, the Rules Committee continues to see unsafe conditions too often and have now escalated those points of emphasis into actual rules. Definitely not something officials want to see, but it is now in the rules and it is something we are obligated to enforce. Let's start with the arm pads. We don't know of any manufacturer that recommends pads for the bicep or tricep area. They are intended for the elbows. If officials happen to see a pad that looks like it is designed to protect the elbow and is not worn there, they should remind that player and possibly let the coach know. If that pad continues to be worn in an unsafe manner, a technical foul is possible. As officials, we do not want to be forced to deal with these issues, and we ask coaches to address this, and preferably do it during practice as well as at games. However, this is a safety issue, and it cannot be overlooked. Next is the additional language around how the chin strap is to be worn. Again, multiple years of points of emphasis on how to wear the helmet did not result in the compliance the committee was looking for, so we now have a rule around that. The chin strap now shall be worn under the chin and shall firmly be attached to the helmet and be attached firmly enough that the helmet cannot be removed without unsnapping or loosening the chin strap. If the officials happen to see a player who puts on his helmet or takes off his helmet and doesn't need to adjust the chin strap doing that, they are directed to send that player off the field and ask the coach to ensure that the chin strap is adjusted so that it meets the requirements before that player comes back on the field to play. If this is happening more than a few times for one team and not just for one player, officials may be forced to start penalizing that team. Coaches, please don't put officials into that situation. I know the coach's certification before every game is kind of seen as a formality we have to go through. It is not. That certification is where the coach acknowledges that they know all of their players have the required equipment and they know that every one of those players has been instructed to wear that equipment properly, including where their arm pads should go, how their chin strap should be worn, all of those details. Lastly, there is language in the rule book for 2027. So not for a few years will this go in effect. 
but it talks about the numbers on the uniform and that they must contrast with the uniform color. There's been uniforms out there where the number and the uniform were basically the same color and there was just an outline around the number, making it hard to read. So starting in 2027, the numbers must be of a contrasting color with the rest of the uniform. Well, that rule 191 update certainly got a little long, but this one's pretty quick. Rule 2-2 was just updated to formally allow for multiple captains. The old language said you could only have one captain. Rounding out the rule changes to rule two were just some changes to what the chief bench official does. The first part really was just moving and changing some language around counting long crosses and then taking out the timing duties for the chief bench official because there should always still be a timer there to take care of those timing duties. Rounding out the changes to rule two were some updates to the duties of the chief bench official. First part was really just fixing language around counting too many long crosses, which is a duty of the chief bench official, and then removing the timing duties from the chief bench official. We don't use CBOs very often, mostly just in the state tournament, but when we do, we almost always have a timer there, so the CBO doesn't need to do that work. Just one minor update in rule three this year, and this is some language changes around those final two minutes of play when we have the automatic stalling rule in effect. It simply clears up the language without making any changes to how we do this. When a team is ahead with a four goal or less lead, that team will have to still get it in and keep it in during the last two minutes of play. Just a minor editorial change in rule three. It updates the language around Automatic stalling in the last two minutes of play, no change in how we're going to call it or how the play will proceed, but just making the language hopefully a little easier to read. In rule three, there was just one minor tweak to the language around the automatic stalling at the end of the game. It seems that the words get it in were left out, so that's been added in, and hopefully the language has been updated to make it a little clearer, but it should result in no change in how the game is being played. Well, we have a few changes in rule four, which is play of the game. The first one is around face-offs. And you can see the language added here is that players shall not initiate a body check against their opponent, a body check against a crouch player that is in a little, 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 little. Next, we're gonna look at rule four, and that's the play of the game section of the rules. And this first change is around face-offs. And you can see it says, players shall not initiate a body check against their opponent, and this is those players who are engaged in a face-off. A body check in that situation is considered an illegal body check. So that's what you can't do. It doesn't say you can't stick check, you can't legally push or legally hold. That's still okay against a player who's facing off. In addition, there is no requirement to quote unquote, play the ball first. We don't want players blowing up the other player with a body check, but they can play otherwise pretty much anything else within the rules. The second part here simply gets rid of the word immediately. It was kind of uh, redundant. Uh, it said had to be raked or directed immediately, and then we said immediately it was within one step. Why not just say raked or directed within one step, which is a change that they made. Next are changes to rule four covering play of the game. We'll start with article three on face-offs. It's already been illegal to body check a player engaged in a face-off, but that language was put in rule six, and now it is here in rule four as well. Just a quick note, this means that a body check that would be legal elsewhere is illegal if you do it to the player taking the face off. However, it doesn't say that stick checks, pushes or holds are automatically illegal when done to a player taking a face off. So if you can legally stick check, legally push or legally hold that player, that is allowed. It's just really hard to do. One of the things we often say to a player is play the ball first. That isn't technically in the rules, but that really says worry about the ball, let the player stand up before you play their body because it's going to minimize the chance of you being called for an illegal body check, an illegal stick check, an illegal push or an illegal hold. The second part of this simply 
gets rid of some extra language, particularly the word immediately, and talks about the ball being raked or directed within one step once it's been clapped. No real change to the rules here, but fewer words that hopefully makes it easier to understand and easier to enforce. Next, we'll look at some changes to Rule 4, which covers play of the game. First is Section 3 on face-offs. Rule 6 already had language making it illegal to body check a player engaged in a face-off, so adding it here in Rule 4 is not a change to the rules, just putting the language in a second place to make it clear. Quick note, what this says is that a body check that would be legal anywhere else on the field at any other time simply is not allowed if done against a player who's engaged in a face-off. What it doesn't say is that you're prohibited from a legal stick check, a legal push, or a legal hold during a face-off. However, you will often hear officials say, hey, you have to play the ball first on the face-off. But that really is saying, because that language is not in the rules directly, is that it's very, very hard to legally stick check, push, or hold a player taking a face-off because they're usually bent over kind of covering the ball. So that's our way of telling a player to be careful even if you're trying to initiate a legal stick check push or hold against a player on the face-off. Second thing you'll see here is a bunch of language eliminated from the section after raking or directing a ball that's been clamped. It's said immediately and then defined immediately to be within one step, and now it just simply says, forget the word immediately, it just has to be raked or directed within one step. Again, not a meaningful change in the language, but hopefully fewer words makes it easier to understand and easier to enforce. Here are some more minor changes made to the rule book in Rule 4 that update the language but really don't change the rules at all. Simply a way to clarify or make it easier to find things. First in 4.3 and 4.6, some changes to the alternating possession rule, which talks about alternating possession being used when there's an error made by the officials or more often a situation that is out of the official's control, like an injured player or an inadvertent equipment issue that happens during a loose ball situation. So those are updated to hopefully make it a little clearer, a little easier to enforce. The second one is this language that says a goal will be allowed if the shot is released prior to the end of the period. That is being moved from one section that talked about when goals were disallowed into a section right nearby that talks about when goals are allowed. So just putting it in the right place so it's easier to find. And finally, a little change in language uh, in Rule 4-22, where it talks about a delay of game penalty. Instead, that language was just updated to say it's an illegal procedure penalty for a delayed restart. So just some minor updates that hopefully make the rule book a little more user friendly. If those earlier changes to Rule 4 really didn't change how the game was going to be played, this rule change probably has the potential to do that. We've always had rules around what to do if a player loses required equipment like a glove, a shoe, or a helmet. It seems that losing your helmet has become a bigger issue and is happening more frequently, so there is added language around treating the loss of a helmet differently. If a helmet comes off, play is suspended immediately. There's no exception to that, no option to waiting around for anything immediate suspension of play and the player that loses their helmet has to leave the field and they must stay off the field until play is restarted and there's been then a subsequent stoppage of play. A similar change in the rules has been made at the college level but how it's being enforced is slightly different so please pay attention to that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because there is a long list of situations that will be published the MSHSL will make that available both to coaches and officials to look at that and read through it so that we are all on the same page as to how this is going to work at the high school level. So please look for those situations when they come out. It's now time to move on to Rule 5, which covers personal and ejection fouls. In particular, we're going to look at some changes to the language on checks to the head and neck. In the past, checks to the head and neck started with a two-minute non-releasable penalty. This year, there's been a change to the rules to add a description of what's called indirect contact to an opponent's head or neck, 
and that is when the initial force of the check is legal. It's to the body and then slides up into the head and neck, and now officials will have the option of giving a one-minute non-releasable penalty for that indirect contact. It could be more if it's excessively violent. Definitely could go up to two, three, or even become an ejection. But it now gives the officials that option of one, two, three, or ejection. So more options here to penalize this. The rest of the uh, language in that part of the rules has not changed. But the hope is here that officials will not be as reluctant to make that call when they can start with a one-minute penalty. And there was one other change made in Rule 5 here in Rule 5-6. It just eliminates some language that's found elsewhere in the rules and wasn't really necessary here. No change to how the rules are going to be enforced, just unnecessary language that we could take away to uh, remove some confusion. So let's move on to Rule 6, which covers technical fouls. The first change you'll see here really is, as the rationale says, adding more accurate detail to this. It really wasn't about the ball being loose. It was about whether the team that was being fouled either had the, had the ball or didn't, or the other team did. And so this really describes how we do this more accurately than it did before. No change in how we're going to call the game, but just uh, more accuracy in the rulebook. The second change here in Rule 6 is kind of a fix to an oops from previous rule books. Uh, back in Rule 4, it talks about a defensive player not being allowed to go into the crease and act like a goalkeeper. And back in Rule 4, it said that this is a conduct foul. Well, nowhere under the list of things that were conduct fouls did it say that. So it's now added in there, and that oops has been fixed. All right, well, that concludes the actual changes to the rules themselves, but we always have some points of emphasis, both from the National Federation of High Schools as well as the Minnesota State High School League. The first one from the NFHS is cross prohibitions. And in the rule book, they wrote, due to current innovations in the construction of cross design, along with stringing at the bottom of the cross, which is designed to withhold the ball from play, the NFHS boys lacrosse, committee felt it necessary to emphasize Rule 1-8, which is on cross prohibitions. So first, I'm going to remind coaches that when you answer yes at the beginning of the game, that all your players are equipped by rule, you are telling us that you have checked their sticks and that they all meet the specifications. So please do that. Make sure the ball rolls out freely from every stick that your players have. That's something you should be doing on a regular basis. I know it's a pain, but really you want to do that. It shouldn't be something that gets caught once we get to a game. Officials, be aware that because they're getting more creative in how they string the crosses and things, that we're looking for that functional sort of test. Does the ball roll out? Does it come out freely? As the rule says, you can't have stringing that retards the normal and free dislodgement of the ball. So if we see that, that's illegal. That's got to get called. Let's hope we don't have to make those calls this year, but if we do, uh, it is a point of emphasis. All right, so that concludes the actual changes to the language in the rules, but as always, there are points of emphasis both by the National Federation and the Minnesota State High School League. The National Federation's first point of emphasis is on cross prohibitions, and they said, due to current innovations in the construction of cross design, along with stringing at the bottom of the cross, which is designed to withhold the ball from play, the NFHS Boys Lacrosse Committee felt it necessary to emphasize Rule 1-8. And I think the big thing that they're trying to emphasize in that Rule 1-8 is that no player may use a cross that has stringing that retards the normal and free dislodgement of the ball. Notice it doesn't say they had to do it intentionally. It's just if that's the function that happens, the ball doesn't roll out easily, it is an illegal cross and it has to be penalized. And that's a point of emphasis here. The other thing I will add, coaches, when we ask you if your players are equipped to play by rule at the beginning of the game, you're saying yes. And one of the things you're saying yes to is that you have inspected their equipment, including their crosses, that they meet all of these requirements. So please take that seriously. Please make sure you're checking equipment, including crosses, on a regular basis. Well, here it is again, everybody's favorite point of emphasis, eye shade. Again, 
The rules committee has said that this rule aligns with rules in other sports, football, baseball, softball, etc. So it's not just lacrosse. They want it out of the game. It's going to continue to be a point of emphasis until it's not a problem anymore. So let's take care of it. On the coach's side, that means talk to your players, tell them not to do it, tell them to clean it up before they get to the game. Officials, on our side, let's think about education versus enforcement. When you get to that game, look over the players. See what they look like with their, their eye black. If it's not legal, get it cleaned up. Don't give them a pass for this game and tell them to get it fixed for the next game. Make them fix it for the game that's there. Remember, this is a one-minute, non-releasable, illegal equipment penalty if the eye shade is more than a single stroke under the eye, inside the eye socket. If it goes down the cheek, across the forehead, over the nose, under the nose, on the chin, wherever. One minute, non-releasable penalty. Nobody wants that. Not the coaches, not the officials, not the players. So let's stop this before the game even starts and pay attention to it so we don't have to have it as a point of emphasis in 2025. The third point of emphasis from the National Federation is properly worn mandatory equipment. We covered this quite a bit already earlier in the presentation, but just a reminder that it does now say equipment must be worn as intended by the manufacturer. So if it's designed to be an elbow pad, it's worn on the elbow, not on the bicep. Uh, we're talking about uh, chin straps being properly worn on the chin, that helmets cannot be taken off without loosening or put on without loosening the chin strap, etc., etc. Coaches, a reminder that when we ask you if your players are properly equipped and you say yes, you're telling us that you have checked this before the game so we shouldn't have to worry about it once the game starts. Officials, we should be practicing education versus enforcement. Be aware when you're on the field before the game. Watch those players. If you see a player slide his helmet on and he doesn't adjust the chin strap, either talk to that player or talk to a coach about that player and say, hey, He's got a problem, and if he wears that helmet that way during the game, it's either going to be sent off or a penalty. These are potentially one-minute non-releasable penalties that we simply do not want to call, and coaches do not want called. And if we can work together to get this fixed, we won't have to worry about that. And the last point of emphasis from the National Federation is around checks involving the head and neck. We talked about the language change there that now has the indirect contact concept included that allows a one minute non-releasable penalty instead of starting with two. But again, we want to protect players' heads and necks. And if there's contact to the head and neck and it's recognized, officials, you need to call it and call it as such. If you don't see it, you can't call it, but let's make sure we're in position making those calls as we need to. The fourth and final point of emphasis from the National Federation is checks involving the head and neck. Of course, we talked about that a little bit in Rule 5, where the addition of indirect contact to the head and neck has been introduced so that there is the possibility for a one-minute non-releasable penalty. But beyond that, we're asking coaches to work with your players so that they know how to make checks properly so we don't have that contact to the head and neck because when we end up throwing a flag, it's already a problem. Someone is already potentially hurt when that happens, and my flag doesn't make them better. So we really want those kinds of checks to not happen in the first place rather than worrying about enforcing them when they do. But officials, if you see it, you got to call it. That's the only way we're going to get this sort of play under control in this game. That ends the... Um points of emphasis that we're going to talk about. Let's talk about the points of emphasis here in Minnesota for 2023, Matt. Yeah, we do have a few here for Minnesota, so let's uh, get on with it. We began some time ago talking about a warning system where we would, if we saw the coaches were not showing any kind of uh, working relationship with the officials, that we would stop play. We would tell the coach that they've been warned. We'd put that warning into the scorebook. It's recorded officially there and it includes the time of what happens. And there's only going to be one of these that ever happens during the game. We're not giving a lot of these out during the season, Matt, but I want you to know that if you're getting one of these, certainly if you're getting one of these from me, 
um, things have really got to the point where your next step, if we can't get you under control of this, that's you're probably not going to be able to stay in the game and officiate. The coach. Sorry. Yeah, and this is not in the rule book. This is a, a rule that's been adopted by uh, the MSHSL, and it mirrors something that they started in basketball and, and found it's worked well there. And I think uh, when it's been used here in Minnesota, it's very effective. It's, it's been effective. Now let's look at the points of emphasis from the Minnesota State High School League. First is the warning system, which we've had in place for a while. This is an option that's outside the rule book because there's no penalty involved with it to allow officials to kind of give coaches a warning that uh, the behavior needs to stop. And so if coaches, as it says, continue to show disregard for the coaches area or disrespect for officials, the officials may stop play, address the coach that they've been warned or the whole team has been warned if it's something other than behavior by that coach. Uh, we report the warning to the official scorekeeper, have it recorded in the official scorebook, and we want to make sure that that's including the time and the quarter when the warning was given. There won't be another warning, and definitely the next time we're going to either go up to a technical foul or a unsportsmanlike conduct personal foul. So with that warning system, just a couple of things. Uh, you don't have to get a warning or give a warning before being called for an actual right. penalty. So there's no requirement to give the warning and then move on to a penalty. You could get the penalty right away. Uh, there is no penalty with the warning. It is truly that, just a warning. So you don't lose possession or anything like that. Although it could, as being an official's timeout, it could stop play when you don't want play stopped. So uh, generally we're gonna look for a, a good time to do that. We don't want to stop play when the opposing team is you know, running their offense or, or you know, about ready to score or anything like that. But if we're warning the team that has the ball, stop play when you think it's appropriate and off we go. We then step in front of the, the scorer's table and tell them specifically to record this in the official scorebook. A few more details about the warning system. First and foremost, there need not be a warning before issuing a technical or personal file for conduct or unsportsmanlike conduct. But when a warning is used, there is no penalty, no loss of possession, no time served. If you're going to do that, you've got to escalate to a technical or personal foul. This official's warning is done as an official's timeout, just like we would for an injured player or loss of equipment. If a team has a ball, they keep it. If they're entitled to it, they get it. If the ball is loose, then we have to go by alternating possession. My recommendation is wait till somebody picks up the ball and then stop playing to do this. That way we don't have to use alternating possession, but use your discretion officials. And again, use your discretion. Don't stop play when the team you're not going to warn might be in the middle of an offensive play. Once a contest has begun, either the officials or the tournament manager may suspend a contest and cannot be overruled by the other party. When in doubt, error always on the side of safety. That's really important. We talked about that earlier. If it's determined that play cannot be resumed at the end of the suspension and three periods of play have been completed, it should be considered a complete game with the winner determined. If a game is suspended before the completion of the first three periods or it is tied at the point of suspension, the game shall be continued from the point of interruption. And the only exception we have on this, we have some special rules with the state tournament. Yep, and this talks about what happens after we start the game. Before the official start time for the game, that decision as to whether to play or not is really up to the, the site manager, the home team, or the host. So Correct. But once the game starts, either officials or the, the site manager has that option. The second MSHSL point of emphasis is suspended and complete games. Once a game has started or once we get past the start time for the game, either the officials or the tournament or site manager can say it's time to suspend that contest and not be overruled by the other side. If it's before that start time, however, that's really up to that tournament or site manager, although we really recommend that both the officials and the coaches be consulted before any decisions are made. In any case, if there's any doubt, just keep it safe. Uh, if a game is then suspended, and it doesn't look like you're going to be able to restart it. If three periods have been completed, then that will be considered a complete game 
and the winner determined assuming there's not a tie. If the game is suspended and we played less than three full periods or it's tied and the teams do decide to continue, then it's going to be continued from the point at which the game was stopped. We don't start over. Uh, there are separate rules for the state tournament. We can go into those if needed at a future time. One other little so detail about along with that uh, point of emphasis headers, on suspended games, complete games, is this idea that sometimes there's a boys and a girls double header, and it might be that the first game, whether that's the boys game or the girls game, might have to be interrupted, and it is not going to be completed, but then there's enough time to continue and play the second game. So just be aware that just because the first game got interrupted and it's going to be declared a complete game because it made it to three quarters, doesn't mean that we have to play the remaining five, six, eight, ten minutes in that game. We can just move on to that second game and get that one started. Uh, essentially to get both of the games in and not have to come back and, and reschedule that second game. And Matt, we know sometimes that it's not just a fact of, of, of the players willing to play or the fans willing to stay or the referees willing to stay. A lot of times this has to do with transportation as an example. that. We have to get those uh, individuals back on the school buses at a certain period of time. Yep, and also sometimes it's just hard to find a time to reschedule, so we'd rather get those games in if we can. third point of emphasis from the State High School League is sidelines, the table coaches and bench areas. In particular, we need to give the table personnel the ability to see the field and do their jobs. And they can't do that when there's players crowding the sidelines. By rule, the bench area should be six yards from the sidelines. We don't often have that, but as far as they can comfortably be based on whatever area we have. And more importantly, that area five, a little more than five up to 10 yards either side of the midfield is, again, coaches only. The players should never, ever be in that area, okay? Please help with this, coaches. Please talk to your players about where they need to be standing and what they need to do because it's really hard on the table personnel when they can't see the field. The fourth so another point of emphasis the that the State High School, High School League wanted to make sure we mentioned was uh, the idea of a unified field. Unified fields have been in the rule book now for a few years, and it is a legal field. So that if you show up and it's playing on a unified field, we play the game because that is a legal field. I think there's been some confusion about the differences between a unified field and the traditional boys field. Um, when we have a unified really, field. the differences aren't so that, that big, Brad. No, they're kind of two different things. So two little things that are different, I think. Yeah, essentially, we, we're going to extend the field from 110 to 120 yards. yards. And the good thing about that That's is, it. if you're playing field, over top of a football field, rather than the end line going yards, through the middle of the uh, end zone, they're at the yards, back of the end zone. So that actually helps with that new rule about continuous lines all the way around. That back of the end zone line is probably continuous for the football team, so that helps. What happens to that additional 10 yards or five yards on each side? Well, where that gets inserted is between the goal line extended and the top of the restraining line or the defensive area. So instead of being 20 yards from the defensive restraining line to the goal line extended, it's now 25. That means it's still 15 yards from the goal line extended to the end line. It's still 20 yards from the center line to the defensive restraining line, but 20 yards goes to 25. Uh, from that defensive restraining line to the goal line extended. And that's pretty much it. So, Matt, if uh, I do 30 games this year on a unified field, how many extra yards am I running compared to previous seasons when I ran on a regular field? I'd like to know this from my age. Did you say how many extra yards you are running? Yeah, that's what I did say, yes. Running, running is probably zero. Okay, <laughs> uh, there you are. Good, uh, good point. Jogging. <laughs>
We're going to have a few extra slides for the coaches this year just to give some examples of questions from the rules test that the officials take. So the first one here has player B1 clearing the ball. He falls, loses the ball, breaks his stick, looks like he's injured, and is outside of the scrimmage area. The officials then need to stop play immediately when? If the player is a defender, if the player is a goalkeeper, if the player is an attacker, or none of the above. Answer is none of the above. If the player is not in the scrimmage area, the officials are allowed to withhold the whistle and let the play continue until we get to a point where there's kind of a natural point to stop it. We often get yelled at, hey, there's an injured player, stop play, stop play. We will stop play when we get to a spot where it feels like that play has kind of come to a conclusion. This question is a very common one we see where the defender's stick gets up between the arm and body of the attacking player and the attacking player kind of clamps down with their arm and hangs on to the defender's stick. What is the correct call? Is that holding by A1 the attacking player where we would give the ball to team B? Is it a legal play unless A1 sort of rips the stick out of the defender's hands? Does the defender B1 have to drop his stick in order to have a a whistle? Or is this simultaneous fouls on both of them and each gets a 30 second non-releasable penalty? Well, the answer is in most cases it's going to be A holding by A1 and we're going to stop playing and give the ball to team B. That's generally what's going to happen here. There are certainly situations where B1 can be doing some holding here so we have to look at some of those subtleties but if A1 really clamps down on B1 and, and is keeping his stick there where B1 can't use his stick anymore, that's holding by A1. This question is about that beloved dive play, which is particularly tricky to officiate. Lots going on. A1 here is attacking, leaves their feet, taking a shot, and the ball goes in the net. While over the crease, there is contact between A1 and the goalkeeper. What's the correct ruling? Is it no goal and give the ball to team B with a possible foul on A1? Is it a good goal if the ball is in the net before contact is made, otherwise it's no goal? Is it no goal with a 30 second penalty on A1? Or is it no goal with a one minute penalty on A1? And the answer is no goal, award the ball to team B, potentially consider a foul on A1. If there is contact with the goalie or contact with the crease on a dive, that is leaving their feet, even if the ball gets in the goal before that contact happens, we're gonna disallow the goal. Every year there's a couple questions on the test about new rules, and this one is about a helmet coming off. So, A1's helmet comes off. What is the proper procedure? As you can see, all four options say stop, play immediately. So I guess that's a given. So do we, under A, have the player replace the helmet and resume play? Or B, remove the player unless the coach wishes to use a timeout to keep the player in the game? C, have the player leave the field and return after the next dead ball following the resumption of play? Or lastly, have the player leave the field and may return as soon as the helmet is properly attached? And the correct answer is, in this case it is C. The player must leave the field immediately and can only return after the next dead ball situation following the resumption of play. They can actually return during that dead ball. They don't have to wait till resumption of play after the next dead ball. No timeout can keep them in the game. Uh, even if they get their helmet back on, they can't come back in. They have to wait until time has run off the clock and we have stopped the clock again. This is a question about the new indirect contact rule that was added to the rule book. A check by A3 results in indirect contact to the head of B2. What is the minimum penalty? Remember, indirect contact is a check that starts legal, but then moves up and includes contact with the head or neck. 
Should that be a two-minute non-releasable penalty, a one-minute non-releasable penalty, a one-, two-, or three-minute cross-checking penalty, or should A3 be ejected from the game? And the right answer is, at a minimum, a one-minute non-releasable penalty. Yes, it could be escalated all the way up to ejection if it's more violent or severe, but generally, indirect contact is going to draw that one-minute non-releasable penalty. Well, thanks, Jason. Um, my name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter, and I'm glad to be back. It's hard to believe that this will be my 16th season working for the MSHSL in this role. Uh, but a few more years of net refing, I suspect. Oh, yeah, I've been doing this for 30-plus years now, I think, on the field, but not quite as long as you, Brad. Well, I, I get asked to come on to this uh, presentation to make Matt look young, so my name is Brad Skiback, and uh, I am uh, very blessed right now to be the National Federation of High Schools Rules Committee member for Section 5, which means I get the chance to actually interact directly with the rule book. And uh, I am proud to say that I began my officiating career as a, a box across referee in Canada. And this year will be my 47th year of refing. So most of these coaches that we're seeing, I probably did them when they first started playing lacrosse. It's been a long time. A long time. Well, glad to have you back, Brad, and looking forward to a great season. So. Let's get on with the rules changes. Sounds great. Hello again, and welcome to the 2024 season. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I'm the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials, as well as the Rules Interpreter, and I'm glad to be back again uh, this year for what is my 17th season in this role. So let's go ahead and get started with the rules changes. Thanks, Jason. Hello, coaches. Hello, officials. My name is Matt Dempsey and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter. I'm glad to be back again for this, my 17th season in this role. Let's get started with the rules changes and updates for 2024. Thanks, Jason, and hello, everyone. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. It's hard to believe that I've been doing this for 18 years, I guess my 17th time through this uh, with our loss of the code. Oh, I don't need to say that crap. Thank you, Jason. Uh, my name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. Glad to be back this year for the 18th year of uh, MSHSL Boys Lacrosse. Let's get started and look at those rules changes and updates for this year. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials and Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse, and glad to be back this year. Uh, let's jump right into the 2024 Boys Lacrosse Rules Changes and Updates. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials, as well as the Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. Glad to be back for this 18th year of MSHSL Boys Lacrosse. And let's get started with the 2024 rules changes. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey. I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials for Boys Lacrosse, as well as a rules interpreter, and I'm glad to be back for this season. Why don't we get started with the 2024 NFHS Boys Lacrosse rules changes. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials as well as Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. It's great to be back for another year of Boys Lacrosse here in the state of Minnesota. And let's jump right into those 2024 rules changes. Thank you, Jason. My name is Matt Dempsey, and I am the MSHSL State Coordinator of Officials, as well as Rules Interpreter for Boys Lacrosse. Great to be back for another year. And let's get right into those 2024 rules changes for Boys Lacrosse. Thanks for listening to the rules update again this year. I apologize that my writers didn't have as many jokes to include this time, but hopefully you found it all useful. Uh, you can find my contact information here on the screen. Please feel free to reach out, either via email, uh, phone, or text message. Happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, now or during the season. 
Well, Matt, before I turn it back to you to do final comments, I just want to uh, take a moment to thank everybody involved in the sport. Officials, be sure to take advantage of the additional boys lacrosse officiating information that is available on the Arbiter Central Hub page. Materials and information will be posted to the Central Hub as those materials are made available. The NFHS has a new website for accessing the rules books and case books electronically. The NFHS All Access website can be found at www.allaccess.nfhs.org. You need to register on this site in order to access the rules book and case book via the new All Access app, which will be described on the next slide. The NFHS All Access mobile app can be found on the App Store and Google Play. You need this app downloaded in order to purchase the rules book and case book electronically. They typically cost around $7. Once you purchase the rules book via the app and you have registered on the All Access website, the rules book and case books can be searched, highlighted, and you can create sticky notes to come back to any place in the rules book or case book that you would like. Again, go to the All Access website, get registered, then download the All Access mobile app and purchase the rules book or case book within the app to begin searching the rules books and case books electronically. Sports specific officiating courses are offered in several sports. They are ideal for new officials or those in their first few years of officiating. These courses introduce officials to the mechanics and techniques used in the sport and provide specific information on an area within that sport. Individuals can complete these courses within 30 to 45 minutes and many of these courses are free. Go to nfhslearn.com to learn more. The NFHS Learning Center is home to more than 90 online professional development courses for everyone within the interscholastic community. Coaches, students, officials, parents, and administrators can find more than 60 courses that are available for free. Go to nfhslearn.com to view the trailers and to learn more. The interscholastic officiating course is available at nfhslearn.com. This course is an introduction to skills and concepts used as an official. Again, this is ideal for new officials or those in their first few years of officiating. Topics include basics of becoming and staying an official, the science of officiating, and the art of officiating. The course is free and you can go to nfhslearn.com to register and to learn more. Every opportunity should be taken to improve upon one's officiating. Clinics, coursework, observations, video review, and association meetings should all be considered when attempting to improve one's skills. The NFHS has provided opportunities for officials and prospective officials to take courses and to review video to support learning and developing officiating skills. Go to nfhslearn.com to view these courses, videos, and other trainings. The NFHS has a video library also available on the Learning Center at nfhslearn.com. There are a number of examples of video to review and to learn from. Again, go to nfhslearn.com to view these videos and to learn more. 
The state coordinator for boys lacrosse is Matt Dempsey, who you heard from earlier. Coaches and officials are asked to contact Matt for any questions on rules, rule interpretations, officiating mechanics, or other questions regarding officiating. The email and phone number contacts for Matt can be found on both the Arbiter Central Hub page and on the coach's dashboard.